Welcome to Transformations, interviewing people changing our world. I'm your host, Diane J. Shaver, and every interview I have with somebody who decided there was one person, one decision, one commitment makes a world changer. So when I interview people, I want them to inspire you. So one day I'll be interviewing you. So today I have the pleasure of speaking with a world changer named Roger Montoya. In 2008, Roger founded a community arts center, Moving Arts Española. But not only does it provide art training, but for 5,000 New Mexican children and youth, but it provides meals and tutoring. So it's kind of an all-purpose thing that really helps out in the community. Classes include, I love this, gymnastics, circus arts, fashion design, singing, violin, ballet, and hip hop. So no matter what a child's interest, they have a chance to develop it. Roger is one of those very rare people who excels at everything. And he sent me, um, I asked for a bio and he sent it to me, but it would take me the whole hour to read the bio. So I just made a list. So here's the list, Olympic gymnast, dancer with the best modern dance companies, choreographer, painter, book illustrator, arts and school program founder, artistic director of Moving Arts Española, guest teacher, lecturer, community activist, social justice advocate. He also has a list of accolades and awards that goes right along with everything that he's done. And again, it would take too long to list all of those. So instead, I want you to have the pleasure of meeting him. So please meet Roger Montoya. Welcome, Roger. Welcome to Transformations. Thank you so much, Diane. It's such a pleasure to be with you. Thank oh, you. Thank you. So one of the things I want to talk about first is your list of accomplishments is so broad and so long. What was it in you that allowed yourself to do all these things? What was it in your upbringing? What was it in your thinking? Because most people stop themselves. So how were you able to do all this? I was very lucky, Diane. I had a set of parents and a family. I'm the youngest of six siblings, and each and every one of my immediate family members saw my talents. They looked for ways to showcase them and to build skills and experiences from a very young age. And so that's essentially why Moving Arts today is what it is. It's a menu of opportunities for kids to sample and taste and discover pathways to a really vibrant life yeah and, yeah. and the arts does it I mean, the arts is so important to everything so how did you go from gymnast and dancer to founding an art center what what was the path what was the trail of crumbs and was it one moment that you decided or was it a series of things in 1972 i saw olga corbett do her thing in the olympics and I was blown away. I became mesmerized with gymnastics and I would never stood upright after that for about five years. <laughs> I was flipping and moving. And so my mother and father said, we need to find a place for him to study acrobatics. At the same time, I was developing parallel skills in drawing and being hyper creative. I was a very, very uh, private child, very shy, painfully show. So in fact, I stuttered horrifically looking back for about 10 years I, I rarely spoke in public and the way that i found my voice was through the physical movements and the expression through the arts from about the age of four and a half to 13 or so was really kind of the formative years wow but i mean it, it just kept going though i mean that was the formative years, but what allows you to keep going? And the reason I'm asking this and kind of focusing on this, I want people to hear that yes. everybody is capable of that, but we don't do it and we stop ourselves. And here's somebody who doesn't stop themselves. So I, I would love to communicate that as Thank much you. as you can. Yeah, well, about what happened is I, I became a competitive gymnast in high school and I was recruited to go to Cal State Long Beach in California to study, to, to be on the gymnastics team on an athletic scholarship. Well, long story short, I had an injury. I decided gymnastics at about 18, 19 was really not what I wanted, but I lost my scholarship. And so I was looking for a way to continue. 
I excelled at the floor exercise the most. I love the space and the acrobatics and the, the notion of performing. And so it wasn't a big leap, <laughs> no pun intended, <laughs> into the dance department. And there I discovered a, a wonderful teacher who had just come from New York City, Mary Jane Eisenberg. She had a background with the Limon Company and ballet, classical ballet. And long story short, she started a company and I joined that company right out of college. And that was my link to New York City. And having spent 12 years prior to that as a gymnast in training, my body was ready. I was very flexible. I was supple. I could lift the girls. I could spin. And so it wasn't um, the arc of training to move into contemporary dance wasn't too big of a stretch. I was only 20. So it was perfect timing. It's so magical. It's wonderful. So what made you want to share this with kids? And why do you think it's important for children? Looking back on my life, you know, I was, as I said, painfully shy, introverted, really um, in trauma in some ways. And I think that it gave me that thread to discover my own voice, my talents, to gain self-esteem to stand up straighter in the world and begin to speak literally. By the time I, I moved into high school and then into college, I, I was beginning to really heal. And I think that the arts were the vehicle therapeutically, mm -hmm. spiritually, physically, to really ground myself as a young man and find my voice. What happened between 1980 and 1990 was the AIDS pandemic in America, and it hit the gay community very, very hard. And so at the end of that decade, I was really pressured. My own health was failing. I had tested positive in 1986. It's now 89. Um, and I decided with the help of Paul Taylor, who passed just this last year and a half, he sat me down and he said, Roger, I see that you're in pain. I see that you're not performing at the level that we need you to. Is there some decision you could make that would be better for you? And it just, the weight came off my shoulders. And I thought of my family and my home and my life back in New Mexico, where I had started a house at mid-decade. And so it was a no-brainer a no to really think about, okay, if I'm going to pass, let me go back. Let me be with my family. Let me do what I can to, to end my life in a way that makes uh, sense. Well, by the time I came back, I, I kind of came back to life. I, I was the stress of the city, the concrete, the crowded, the sort of inconsequential nature of being an artist in New York City in some sense. You know, there's a dime a dozen. There's, here, there was space, literally. I began to work with children and we began to see some change. And that, that was the step, the, the pivot, if you will, into a life that I'm now living in New Mexico. It, that's such a powerful kind of thing. I mean, and for you, it was visceral. I mean, the, the land, the dynamics of it. And in New York, you're right. It's the best of the best. So what? You know, it's like, yeah. So this was your roots, I guess, coming back to your roots. So that healed you. It really did. It, it, gave, it took a while. You know, it, it, was a, it was a period. But I think immediately the sense of, of, of breathing the air and picking up my palette, my, my paint brushes, which I hadn't really done for about a decade. I was kind of a hobbyist while on tour and traveling. And, but I was actually able here to open a studio space and go out into the landscape and set up my easel in the Rio Grande, knee deep, and just paint in the plein air style. What was so beautiful in the late 80s, I was able to travel to the Europe's most incredible museums. And I was, I was palpably moved by the Impressionists. Yeah. There was something about that, that spatial, that atmospheric, the collection of strokes that sort of magically found themselves forming an image or a sensation that really re resonated with me. And so I spent about a decade painting and my painting career just started to emerge organically. And I was able to, to expand my house by about 3000 square feet with the proceeds 
from sales of paintings. So a, a spirit of enterprise arose in me and a confidence that my life skill, my love, the thing that I woke up to do each day could actually sustain me. So that was another paradigm shift. That's a very powerful thing for people to know because I think as I look around and I've been an entrepreneur my whole life, but as I look around, people are feeling like they have to work for a company. They have to do it for so many years. They have to move on. They have to um, subjugate what they want to someone else. So this is very powerful that you were able to, to know this, to actually do this. And I, the thing about impressions that struck me, impressions are about light and you're living in a place that has incredible light. I mean, New Mexico yep. is amazing, so. It really is. It's one of those places that's not too different from where Van Gogh painted in the south of France. And, you know, it's, it has a similar feeling in some ways. Yeah. It's magical. It is magical. So from there, how did Moving Arts come? Did, they, did you start it in your beautiful 3,000 foot house or square feet house? Or what did you do? Well, about, about at the end of the 80s, I was starting to dance again and I was painting and I just had done about seven years of philanthropic work with an organization I created called Espon um, HIV Education, Longevity, Prevention and Support, mm -hmm. Española Helps. And that organization created funding for men and women living in New Mexico who really wanted to marry the notion of Western medicine the AZT, the antivirals, with really organic, uh, prescriptive, self-selected modalities. Mm -hmm. So we made a, a huge dent, really, in serving populations here in New Mexico that you didn't have to rely just on Western medicine. Mm -hmm. You could find a way that really felt true to your own being. And so was, at the end of that process, I was now teaching about 2,000 kids, gymnastics. I had a, a project here at the local college. My painting career was looking really amazing. And I said, you know what? I'm alive. It's been eight years. <laughs> Definitely not going to die today. It's time to drop the banner of, of AIDS poster boy and really move into a broader gift back to the community. So I entered an, a, a small school in my pueblo, my, my town of Velarde, the Velarde Elementary School and began to volunteer with teaching painting and dance. Well, very quickly, it turned into the arts in the schools model for the Española district. And we've raised over $5 million wow. in 12 years from a legislative um, act that came into play in 2002. So I became the director of 13 schools and about 3,000 kids and 270 artists that traverse the landscape literally in every form with integrated school day work as that was ending it was clear that the kids in the district having a small taste during the school day were anxious and ready for an after school program so that's essentially was the birth in 2008 of moving arts in partnership with the local school district we went to the superintendent he said, wow, that's a great idea. I have a spare room. Why don't you set up in this space? And within three months, we had 150 children and they moved us to an abandoned high school where we stayed for six years. And then we moved in partnership with the Pueblo about six years ago. And so we're now in the space that we are now, which is a reimagined casino <laughs> on the Pueblo of Okewinge, which is in the middle of a reservation where poverty is really high, the multicultural richness is really high, the potential in beauty and the children and mix of cultures is, is ripe. And then we had this building that was thrown away that we just were allowed to lease and reimagine as Moving Arts Española. What a great story. I love this. So what do you see happening to these children that, that come into these programs? I mean, they come from a culture, if, if we had been smart, if the gringos had been smart, we would have listened to all the native people who had the answers to everything, but we didn't do that. So it, it feels like what we've done to native culture, we've dismissed them and we've put them aside, but they hold the key. 
in my estimation anyway. So how do you see changing the lives of these kids? Well, I've been doing this work for 25 years and Moving Arts is just 12 years old. Okay. But we, in the last 10 years, have begun to see a couple generations of kids that were, when we started, were 13, and then kids that were three are now moving into high school, and a whole crew went on to college. We have a partnership with the New Mexico School for the Arts. It's a charter high school, and it's in Santa Fe, New Mexico. It is an extraordinary master's program. And so we funnel kids directly into that charter high school for the arts, for those that are really looking at arts education and arts pathways. Many kids gain the confidence, the soft skills, the um, passion and purpose to move into any field. And the arts gives them the confidence. You know, if they did some drama or music or whatever, they have a sense of themselves yeah. and a sense of, of communicating and working in team because of the work we do here. So to answer your question, there are too many to count success stories of young people who have moved out into the world and started their own companies or their own businesses or in college or many have entered social work, which is a very interesting uh, turn because when you're looking at a trauma-informed setting where adverse childhood experiences are uh, and the lived experience of that can be transmuted into uh, a place where uh, healing can can be imparted to others and that's really embedded in our mentorship program here where half of our staff we have 36 contracted workers half of them are youth ages 12 to 22 wow. yeah it's beautiful so kids stay here at this setting for a decade and when you have that kind of luxurious time to invest and nurture and grow together Miracles can happen. Yeah. Lives can be launched. And it's true because the arts are an expression of your inner being. I mean, it's, that's the only thing that you have when you're either painting or dancing or whatever. It's coming from the essence of you. So to raise, and I can see how powerful this is because to raise children that have been allowed to contact their inner self and express it that's one of the most powerful things that you can give anybody and i can see that, that would sustain them for life yes yes because i think at the at the distilled most poignant piece of this whole thing is the fingerprint you know that we are individuals and unique mm -hmm. and this notion that you have to get a degree or you have to do some career in order to get to the next hurdle if you have not been awake enough or um, in connection enough with your own self to know your passion and purpose, perhaps you're not living a life that's really fulfilling because that will sustain you. That will create a unique pathway where you can wake up every day and be fulfilled and energized to bring something to the world that's not put upon you. I, I think that's really what I've been striving for. And, I discovered it by accident. I mean, in a way, just yes, yes and became, no. <laughs> it became yes. It became very clear to me that that is why we exist at our best, and it's perpetuating a new generation of young people. I think you, you've hit on the answer. It's things that we need to do for young people and and older people too can benefit from that. But I, I think about when I, I listen to talks about colleges, they talk about, well, when you do this, you're, you can get a job in this law firm, you can get a job in here. And it's become about jobs. It's not about education at all. So what you're doing is helping people to get back to what an education is. An education should be an exploration of self and how you fit into the world. You know, it's like, so that's what you're doing. This is this is amazing stuff. So I I also want to ask your opinion about something, and that's uh, really is an opinion. I recently saw um, a program where it was one of the communities here that had a lot of racial tension, and they did a play, The Arts Again, and the play was different. Uh, characters who were police and or or African-American 
um, citizens. And they were up there and they would just one at a time tell their story. This is my day. This is what I experienced. And in the um, audience were police and community leaders. It changed people. So how can we use the arts to bring people together? How can we use this um, wonderful ability to help people break through barriers because we're not doing it in any other way. So I want your expert opinion, if you would. Well, in my experience, in my opinion, the best investment is in young people. Yeah. When they are able to find their voice, they're empowered. Um, part of my work, I, I, I'm working in a broader community context today, looking at social determinants of health, around food insecurity, education, recovery, homelessness. And in that realm, um, the young people's voices, we've done a couple of panels where we pull together uh, speakers, young people who have lived experience from the Pueblos, Mexicano from the Frontera, immigration, homeless in young people between 13 to 18. And when they come together to speak on these panels on human rights, on the very notion that you have a place in the world and you have a right to a safe home and parents and career and clean water and a healthy planet. That's been one of the most uh, fruitful, I think, because when we stop and we listen to the voices of our young people, then we, then we can begin to work. Because as adults, we have our own baggage. We've collected it for decades and we can sort of be oppressive in how we prescribe things should be but i think the upcoming generation has the freshest take on what the direction should be for all of us collectively and and then for their own lives and finding their place in service and in creativity that makes perfect sense how can we utilize them more i mean i i interviewed jimmy margolin who is um at 16 years old organized the climate strike that was all over the world and now they're doing a big um, climate initiative uh, in September yes. and so she's one of them but how can we get more of these young people out there and and Greta Thunberg is coming to the states she's on her way to the states by the way incredible I think the Parkland you know high schoolers who are now probably in college that group a couple years ago totally inspiring Greta there's uh, local groups, indigenous young people here looking at, for example, we live in the shadow of Los Alamos National Laboratory, the place where the most dangerous nuclear bomb was created. Yeah. And yes, it's an economic engine and has been for 70 or 80 years for jobs, but at what expense? So I'm really excited to see that there's a body of young people locally and internationally on all sorts of converging fronts that focus and are demanding that the adults really bring change and they're catalyzing that change. So to answer your question more clearly, I'm working with, um, it's a political action group and they asked me to engage you because we see so many. And I said, you know, the census is coming up yeah. and the mm -hmm. census isn't about any rate, any party, it's not middle, it, it's about being counted. And New Mexico loses millions of dollars for undercounting, because, partly because it's a very high poverty. Our population of 2 million only for the whole state is spread over out into frontier communities, down dirt roads. There's grandparents raising kids. And so this whole notion of how do we count? So I propose to the leaders in a non-partisan way, give us a chunk of funding. We're going to train a core group of young people to use technology to go out and interface and get the count to happen. So that's one action piece we're doing right now that I think is really critical because A, it'll create jobs for kids. It'll instill a sense of leadership, passion and purpose, hopefully, that they're making a real difference by bringing back many, many millions of dollars to our state that is so, so needed for social services, roads, infrastructure, public health, etc. So that's that's one way I can think on the ground, but I'm I'm really excited to see these movements across the globe where young people are taking charge. That I love what you're doing. That's amazing. And I'm all this is always a question for me. 
how can we hook up all of these groups? I mean, it's important that the group is doing what they're doing, but I, I think if they could just um, have a loose alliance with everything else, because then people would see these are enormous groups, enormous. Um, yes. And so I, it's like, it, it's always a puzzlement to me how we do this, how we go from like your group in New Mexico and get them out in South Carolina or get them out in Washington or wherever. So just your fantasy of how can we do this? Well, I think something we didn't have even 20 years ago was this level of technology. Yeah. You know, people complain that young people are on Facebook and they're buried in their phones and they're not connected to the world. But I beg to differ. They are connected in a very different way than our generation. Yes. And if we can shift and use those tools in ways that connect the young people's hearts and minds and movements, that's one way to virtually connect and to get a sense of community on a global scale instantaneously. Yeah. I love the notion of face-to-face, -face, you know, there's nothing better than giving someone a hug or, or a dialoguing, you know, with them directly because that's where, as human beings, we're at our best. But in the absence of that, I think technology, and then if we can find a way to inter interconnect even just regionally in New Mexico, yeah. we were participants in um, the Mark Wahl Wahlberg opioid awareness uh, event here in our state. We catalyzed and brought together 4,000 living high schoolers in one space and 3,000 were live streamed statewide last uh, March. And it was a phenomenal experience because the power of group and the presentation that the Mark Wahlberg Foundation created, it was, it was, it was kinetic and really carried forth. We brought back a series of interactive youth-led summits here in our local school districts where 800 youth came together and they were facilitated, they had performers, they, they just really felt empowered. And in fact, they called their movement Empowering Youth, Our Voices Matter. We're getting ready to mount the fall series at the middle school and then two regional high schools. So it's, it, it, it's, it's moving on the ground. I think all politics and change is local. It starts in your own heart mm -hmm. and your own spirit to make a difference. And the smallest incremental step and engagement of one more person and becomes two and four and 20 and 80 mm -hmm. is the way to go. Um, I look at the time I have left. I look at my watch, <laughs> you know, 20 years of good work where I'm still physically strong and I want to make every second count that's what i that's why i get up in the morning i just i'm just electrified and i'm on fire i'm committed to seeing that happen every single moment of my living time here left on earth but that passion is something that is missing in our culture so i love that you have it i love that you're living it it's important for people to see. And that's why this interview is so important for people to yes. see somebody who's actually doing this and who is so alive and so caring. Yes. I also, um, I think that one of the other um, people I had the privilege of interviewing has a Center for Citizenship and Social Responsibility um, in Massachusetts. And these are kids that are in high school. And again, they have projects that have to be done in the community and they have to have them, and you can see them light up when they do it. And the second person, I'm gonna send all these people to you and you can um, interact or, or whatever. And the other person I wanna to introduce to you is Theriel um, Pearson, and she has a, a group called the Secret Kindness Agents. And mm. after the Parkland um, <laughs> horror, um, she was really upset, so she went to her high school students and she said what can we do to make this a better world a kinder world so she said what if we did acts of kindness every day and you know you tell people that you've done it and they said no you can't tell anybody because if you tell somebody that you're doing something kind it's about you so they got secret agent names and every day they do something to help somebody without any kind of acknowledgement so I want to get her in touch with you as well. So I, I have a passion for hooking up all of these groups. I think that um, y'all need to know about one another. 
And um, just who knows how that will work out, but I think it's important. It, I, I concur. I, I think you're on to something. Yeah. And the one I'm the sorry. Go ahead. No, it's okay. One of the other things I want to do, this, all of these interviews are going to go into a book next year. But beyond that, what I really want to do is get all of you together that I can in one place. I don't know where it will be, where we can invite people to come and listen to your stories and see the demonstration of this is what's possible. So that's, that's a big thing. I want, I want that gathering. I think gathering is so important. And that's I do me. Yes. Yeah. I, I would love to participate and I'll commit right here now to whatever that looks like, making that happen, because I too believe, you know, I'm a performing artist. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an artist and, and life can be presented in a way. It's a fine line between commercializing, but how can I say this? Moving arts is an experiential living vessel. And when people enter, and there's the food and the performing and the children and the tutoring and the community, they are immediately overtaken with the feeling that you can't put your finger on it, but it's like, it's warmth. And I think that demonstration, as you said, is the best way to inspire people because so many people here and, and other places are, they're complacent, they are in fear, they're in PTSD, they're paralyzed. They don't feel or believe that they can make a difference in any way. And if they don't see something different, they won't ever be able to, to realize it for their own lives. Yep. So the part of our mission here at Moving Arts is to use color and to use the power of community and to use the connectedness to inspire them visually, sensorially, in any way we can. And it's working. It's yep. so exciting. Yeah. And it goes right to the heart. I mean, that's what the arts do. They bypass the intellect and they yep. go right into the heart. So you have no choice but to respond. Yes. And that's what the power of that is. You know, so I agree. We're so on the same page. We are on the same page. And I, I this is not nice, but I want to admit, I, I had you already signed up for the gathering of, of everybody together. So you were already <laughs> considered in there. So well, thank good. you for saying you were interested. I appreciate that. So yeah. what's next for um, the Moving Arts Española? What's, what's coming up for it? That's a really good question. Um, we're looking at a transition of leadership that will be over the arc of time. We don't want to just do something quickly. A couple of years ago, our board was saying, well, you know, Roger and Sal Salvador, my partner can't do this forever. Let's put out a call and, you know, hire some people from somewhere else to do this. And we decided that, look, right before us, hiding in plain sight, are our students, our young people who have lived this and helped create it brick by brick. Why not invest in those young people to perpetuate this with new energy, new life, new blood, expansive thought, enterprise? And so we're in the process of that. We have, as I said, 15 to 16, 18 kids every semester who are working here. And they are our pool of the next leaders. So we're looking at where will we be physically? We love being in partnership with the Pueblo, the tribal communities. It's, it's a beautiful, symbolic and authentic relationship that's so important for a bunch of reasons, particularly where we are culturally and otherwise um so i guess there's a little bit of a lack of a final strategic point we have a very good focus we have a five-year plan but we really need to, to think 10 15 years out because this won't end we're just not we're not sure this recent nomination by cnn has really been very humbling um i believe that it's less about the me and really needs to shift to the we at some point and be reminded that no one person can do what a community can. However, I'll take the accolades for now. My partner Salvador absolutely deserves at least half of this accolade because he's just toils in a very different way, but a very important way to support this vision. Um, 
we are hopeful as a group that the CNN Heroes opportunity can be leveraged in a way that will help us to perpetuate and take those next steps. But if this is as far as it goes with the nomination, it's, it's been a wonderful ride and we have learned and we've been able to reflect on our own work because of the dynamic team at CNN. The producer has been extraordinary. Her work was world-class. That's Kathleen wonderful. Toner is her yeah, name. I have a feeling it's gonna open some other doors. I don't know what they are, but you can feel it. I'm yeah, sure. I can feel it and it's beautiful. So I can't answer your question completely, but it will be dynamic. It will continue and it will evolve. Yeah. And I, I mean, my sense of it is that it's going to be something that you didn't even think about and it's just going to be organic. Yeah. So yeah. wonderful. So That's how my life has moved so far. Every, about every decade, there's a major shift, sort of a new branch yeah. to my life and the trunk holds strong, but it's unexpected in a way. It's like, oh, I guess we're going over here. <laughs> it's happening, and a decade passes, and suddenly there's a new opportunity. And, and like a tree, it begins to balance itself and form um, a canopy of support and and shade and sustenance yeah. that is true and real and beautiful. Yeah. So the next question is. Is there anything left undone in your life, things that you wanted? You've done so much. Is there something else that you're wanting to do that you've thought about and maybe put it off and no, maybe? I want to see this region lift. And by that, I mean, I want to see education and health really move the needle. Yeah. I want to see people en masse find the same kind of abundance and abundant life that I have. Mm -hmm. And my new role with United Way of Northern New Mexico as something called the Collective Impact Director is allowing me to do just that. We're looking at housing sh shortages and, and homelessness in really creative ways. People say, how can you do that work is now so boring compared to moving arts, you know, I'm doing the art stuff anymore. I said, I beg to differ. It's the same work. It's a landscape, a blank canvas, there's a lot of resources sitting around. Some are people, some are buildings, some are money, pots of money, um, siloed uh, entities that are doing good work. But if we connected those siloed entities together, we can elevate. So that's really the, the strategic design of you know being able to listen, to pull together, to convene, to inspire, to execute. Um, and so... Me and my, my uh, young assistant are, are moving mountains in just the six months since we've been hired. So to answer your question, I think my next wave will be very um, external uh, and, and moving uh, health measures in, in ways that across sectors and systems for broader public health and wellness. It, it sounds vague, but it's, it's really important to me, and it is how I'll live the rest of my life. Wow. How, how fabulous that you know that. And uh, you said something in passing, but it was one of the most important things, I think, and that is new approaches. Because we look at welfare, and somebody else that I interviewed said this, and they said it so well, and that is sometimes when there's a need in a community, they have people from the outside coming in who have no experience of that, have never suffered through those things or anything, and they impose... Um, sanctions or whatever and it does more harm than good and what i'm hearing from you is that you're coming from the inside of this and finding solutions that fit the community that are not imposed upon them and that's, that's exactly problem. right yeah. that's exactly right yeah. i think there's great um uh damage that can be done when that other model is is imposed mm -hmm. because a nobody's going to buy into it they see it as an outsider coming in. When you take the very um, worst or the most challenging social ills and you begin to compost them, to speak metaphorically, and you begin to turn those very um, places of suffering into the very vehicles for change, for example, the homeless recovery, why not invest time, treasure, and creativity into enterprise 
to rehabilitate and re reactivate lives who are normally thrown away, incarcerated, death, crime, drug addiction. The cost to society for that model, we know what that's about. I want to see that we we don't try to pretend that we don't have those challenges, but we go right to the core of them with love, creativity, and light, and we solve problems and we create solutions that empower those very people who are suffering and thrown away to have a life yeah. of action and purpose. And it's working. There's some really dynamic programs that we've been able to bring into play already with law-assisted diversion programs where instead of incarcerating and putting people in, a, in peril, we're bringing the social services and wraparound services that they need to, to be healed before we're going to incarcerate. We have that in the youth. We have that. We're looking at public housing that's really organic and really supportive with all of the services embedded in the living environment, with gardens and play areas and the arts, but a very thoughtful design that allows low-income housing to not just be, okay, here's an a awful building, go live in it, and you're on your own, but giving that community the, the pieces that they need to heal. So it's like a living wellness center community slash, I don't know, it, and we've got three of those burgeoning right now in design mode. So I'm really excited about those. Yeah, I would be. I, that, that's amazing. And we, I think we need to start looking at people as resources, not problems. Yes. That they have within them. I mean, everybody's probably seen on Facebook, there was this um, uh, video of uh, obviously homeless man. And somebody had a piano out on the... Um, sidewalk in front of their cafe and he would come and play and people started listening to him I mean now he's giving concerts he's writing music so it's like it, it's just like seeing the soul of somebody allows them to find what they need in order to be whole yes that's kind of that's kind of it and that's sort of what you're doing all the way around it is and I think some people see it as romantic and you know unrealistic and Pollyanna and you know oh god what a oh brother you know he's <laughs> but I insist on it I can't live any other way I insist on the very best and the most graciousness that we can bring to all of us especially the people who are most vulnerable the kids the families uh, the elderly you know what a treasure to have our seniors with us still yeah but to not capture and and really bring them into the fold intergenerationally yeah. is a missed opportunity yeah. so in a community like Española and the Pueblos here we have a very small population and I love that because when I was living in New York and LA I couldn't sense that I was making a difference yeah. I, but I do here yeah. every day we're making movement we're, we're inspiring people and they're responding in the most beautiful ways so I'm hopeful well, I, I, it goes beyond hope. You've already demonstrated. So it's just going to be more of that. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> but you know, one of the things you just touched on, too, is elders. That in, in uh, traditional societies, elders are treasured. And in China, the elder, I don't know how it is now under communist China, probably not so much. But elders were always treasured as, as wisdom keepers. Yes. So it's, it's just, and, and what you're saying, it's, it's so far from the end of Pollyanna stuff because the other way of approaching things has not worked and it's led us to where we are now so it's been demonstrated over and over and over again that it just doesn't work so what you're doing does work you've had that demonstrated over and over again so here we have empirical evidence yes exactly and it's not really new i think the best of humanity over time immemorial has been evidenced in that we used to do these very organically you know even 100 years ago in new mexico or 70 years before the los alamos national labs or the railroad came through this was a very agrarian place dirt poor yeah. but people lived in sustenance they supported communities there was this notion of of the elders had their place and of reverence and storytelling mm -hmm. and and again it's could be looked at as romanticizing, but right before us is a model. 
if we strip away all this other stuff and we go back to the core of the earth, the land, and why humans exist in this place called earth, I think we can heal and, and find that the true moral path of how we can live in reverence to the land, in reverence to each other, and in service. Pretty simple. It's simple and clear, and it's a straight line. And I, I think the kids that are coming up with the climate change thing are, are kind of focusing on that sort of thing. And one of the things is we stop treating one another humanely. <laughs> And people sometimes become objects and it's stepping stone to whatever greater whatever somebody is, is trying to achieve. And we've just lost all that. And we, we've lost our soul in a way. And we've lost the joy in life because all those things go together. They, they did a study, they, whatever, um, did a study. And the happiest people were in Bhutan that has no uh, police force, no uh, military. Um, and someplace in a little village in China that people had nothing and they were friends and they were um, Everybody had a place to live and they had food and so forth, but they were the happiest people and so all of our Striving for things has not produced happiness and hopefully we'll get that Yeah Some of my most beautiful time in the last decade, uh, well, now about 15 years ago, I went back into Mexico. I didn't speak Spanish. I reclaimed my bilingualism in Oaxaca, Mexico, deep in the south. And I was so taken by the elderly, the, the work ethic, the, their little bodies and just their absolute happiness. With, by our standards, nothing. Dirt poor communities, but they have rich culture that has existed for thousands of years. They have food they produce. They, it was just so poetic. I almost felt like I was going back in time, you know, and really witnessing and then being part of. And it was profoundly healing to reclaim my language mm -hmm. and to rec reclaim by demonstration a visual and visceral um, healing by seeing what's possible and what we've lost, as you said. It can be reclaimed and it must be reclaimed and it can live side by side by technology and all the beautiful things we have today that are good, but it can't be one or the other. It has to find a grace and a balance and an insistence on the humanity. Yes. That's the piece that's missing. Absolutely. Yeah. You've hit on it all across the board. You haven't said one untrue thing. How is, how is that possible? This is wonderful. So what are the things that you are needing in your community now? What if, if this goes out to the world and people are listening, what would you say that they can contribute? What can people contribute to what you're doing, to what your community is doing? Well, if they're interested in helping us in this region, they can always do the old school contributions. And that's great, we can use that. But I would be more interested in the replicability of what we're doing, mm -hmm. the model of a moving arts, however it might look. What community doesn't have empty buildings? What community doesn't have a plethora of artists who need employment and the beauty of imparting and sharing their knowledge across media? What community doesn't have unmatched numbers of kids and youth and families kids of all ages who need healing it's a recipe really that is replicable and i would never presume that it's important for me for it to be called moving arts cincinnati or moving arts bangladesh but the very um focus of what we're doing the sort of the recipe in its clearest form i think you know there are many other models that are similar so i'm not proposing that we're that unique, but we do have a certain something here. So my wish to answer your question is that people might find a way to, um, to be inspired and that maybe we can help to create a, a teaching tool, a professional development tool to, to inspire other communities. So are you ready to get on the road and start talking to people? Yeah, I, actually, I, I have a feeling, I have this intuition that one of the next steps is for somehow 
that the moving arts model will expand in a global sense. I don't know what it'll look like, but it, I, 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 deep in my soul, I sense that that's the next step. And it's not about me, it's about the army of young people that we're training who will do that work. Yeah. And that's the most exciting thing to me is to know that they will be the ambassadors and, and, and help inspire other young people to carry forward. I love that. Is there any last words that you want to say to people? Um, because I know your time is valuable and I don't want to keep you beyond time. So any last words, anything we didn't cover, anything you want to put out there? I'm inspired by your work, Diane, in that you are capturing these stories and that you have the sense and the foresight to, to uh, capture them, to share them, and to connect. Because I think that the media that you're using is really important and really powerful. So I commend you. And I, when I got your call to be part of this, I was so moved that I cleared the schedule to be, to be with you because I think what you're doing is very important. Thank you. That, that touches me deeply. Um, yeah, I want to make a difference. I want people to see what's possible. And especially now, I think people really need to know that. So I will be calling on you when we start putting this together. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. Roger, I've, never been, I've never been to your place where you live, so maybe I need to come and visit you. Well, Charleston, South Carolina needs what you've got. And we, we are so far down in the ranks of education, of helping our African-American community. I mean, they need you. And I'm, as we're talking, I've been thinking about how that would work. So we may be talking about that again. So Wonderful. Roger, I can't thank you enough to, to be able to speak with somebody who's in their heart as much as you are and who are, you're willing to do whatever is in your heart. That is amazing and inspiring and my listeners are very lucky to come across you. So thank you so much, Roger Montoya, founder, artistic director of Moving Arts Espanol, Española, and who knows what else is gonna come along the pipe. So thank you again, Roger. This has been a privilege, a delight, a joy. Thank you. Blessings to you. And thank you to our audience for joining us on Transformations, Interviewing People, Changing Our World. And remember, all it takes is one person, one decision, one commitment. You can change the world. So join us next time. Be inspired. Maybe I'll be interviewing you next time. So I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.